Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome, Kathy McLaughlin. You have uh, been in that rare place in life where you were cradled in the arms of death and somebody reached in and pulled you back. Yeah. What's it like knowing that you were there? How did it change you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's terrifying. There's no two ways about it to actually realize that this could be it. And I think what changed me through all of that was the ability to step back and really think about how I'm spending every moment, even at that moment, when I, especially at that moment, I guess, when I thought this could be my last or I might not come out of this surgery, which is mostly the thoughts that I had. So let's go to that, first of all, because anybody who's watching it would go, well, what that. happened to it? What yeah. happened to you? Like, how close were you yeah. to not being here today? Probably closer than I actually knew because the doctors are astounded that I'm actually here talking to you now. There were, you know, comments afterwards like, you know, miracles do happen or, you know, mission impossible accomplished. And mm -hmm. I had never thought it was mission impossible, but clearly the doctors did. Wow. Well, okay, let's rewind the clock a little yeah. bit. You get diagnosed with cancer. Yes, that was 20 <laughs> years ago. 20 years ago. The first diagnosis, yeah. So what happened then? That was a big wake-up call, but it was a short-lived one. It was only about a four-month process for me. It was early. It was stage two Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I was a uh, you know, self-professed workaholic at the time. I was in the process of starting up a new cell phone company, which everyone knows now is Fido. Uh, and I really had just been on the job maybe a couple of months, and I was diagnosed, at, you know, also just turned 40, diagnosed with stage two Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, the treatment for that was four uh, months of chemotherapy, so eight rounds of chemotherapy that I had to go through. So I managed to uh, schedule those on Friday so I didn't miss a lot of work, recover all weekend and come back to work on Monday because we had a lot to do. Huh? We had to set this, <laughs> I know, right? Huh? I know. But you know, I, I didn't, I took it seriously and I did a fair bit of soul searching through that four month journey because when you're sitting in the chemo ward with, you know, the IV and you really have to slow down <laughs> and think about things. And, mm -hmm. and I really took to heart what are the messages that I'm giving myself or that my body is giving me about the way I've been living my life. So what were those messages and how did they influence yeah. you when you return yeah. to normalcy? Well, to be honest, I'd already sort of dealt with them. And I, I guess in hindsight, I almost had this premonition or saw, saw it coming because uh, I was in a... Uh, previously to going to FIDO, I had been in a, uh, an environment that for me was toxic. It was a large corporate um, situation and I don't deal well in those situations. So I you know, made plans to go. I left to go to FIDO, which was a company that at the time was much more aligned with my values, loved the people who were starting it up and it was actually a great scenario for me. Um, but it was two months later that I got the diagnosis. So I know in some ways I was under so much stress that I allowed myself to be, uh, invite the conditions to, to be sick. Mm -hmm. It was what my brain was telling me about being in that environment. Mm -hmm. That like I was in survival mode, I could feel my adrenaline going crazy. I knew I was just physically under stress because of the mental stress. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just didn't escape soon enough. I mean, Bernie Siegel actually in his book talks about trigger events that mm -hmm. happen a year and a half or 18 months prior to you getting diagnosed with cancer. Another radical thought, but for me, if I went back 18 months, it was probably the worst era of my career for a variety of reasons. What's interesting though is, okay, so you start to deal with this and you think, yeah. okay, you know, I, I got my life back. Yep. Yep. Uh, getting out of that toxic, stressful environment yep. would be uh, uh, job, one for job me. number one. But now you get things back on track. Yes. And Unfortunately, then, the story doesn't end there. No, it doesn't. No, and for seven years, I was trucking along nicely. I mean, things changed for me in the FIDO environment. It got to be a bigger corporate situation. And I recognized that, again, this is not somewhere I wanted to be. So I, I changed careers a couple of times. And, uh, and I was dealing with it as if the, the one path I had to fix or get right was work. Uh -oh. And it wasn't just about that. As riveting as this is, I've got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you.
Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was continually making other plans and then it was seven years after my first diagnosis when I was um, inadvertently diagnosed with a recurrence of the cancer. Inadvertently? Yeah. Is that because of the way that you found out? Yes, it was. Because ever since I'd had chemo, my big toenails kept falling off every year just prior to sandal season, which was really annoying. And so I finally took the bull by the horns and decided to go and see my GP and, and un, you know, figure out if I had a fungus or something and that they could fix it. He said, well, you might, um, but the first thing is you have to have a blood test to determine if you're uh, okay to take the medicine because it can be harsh on your internal organs. So I went to the blood test and then I got the call from the doctor's office saying, come on back, doctor wants to see you now. But I went in to see him and he said, my liver enzymes were eight times normal, like ridiculously high. Uh, he said, if I didn't see you sitting here across from me looking relatively healthy. I would think this, this, these were the test results of a very, very sick woman. I went, okay, so you have the wrong person, the wrong test. But then I was plunged into three or four months of um, toxic diagnosis. I was put through all kinds of, uh, I had a laparoscopy. A uh, biopsy that went south and ended up creating an infection. And at the end of three and a half months, they still had not figured out what was going on. Something was wrong with my liver, and they, you know, the doctors suspected maybe the cancer was back. But finally, I'm lying in my, my hospital bed after this bad biopsy, and the GP comes back to see me, and he spent half a day in there reading my binder. He read the binder and he said, So, I guess you know what's happening. And I went, mm. No. Um, and he said, well, you have a relapse of your Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's stage three. So you have cancer again. I have cancer again. And your liver's in trouble. Well, he, mm -hmm. he, I thought he meant that the liver was in trouble because of the cancer, and it had progressed to my liver. And he said, but that's not all. It's, it's not that. You actually have end-stage cirrhosis of the liver, stage four. End-stage. End-stage. End-stage cirrhosis of the liver that is not related to the cancer. You have two parallel and separate diseases. Either which could kill you. Either both were going to kill me because they were in stage, like stage three is pretty serious cancer. And the worst part was they were accelerating each other. So somehow feeding off each other and racing to the finish, is how I put it. So in that moment, what do you start thinking about your life in, in that moment? I thought, what is it that I haven't gotten right? Because That's where you went. That was the first thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Not everybody would go there, right? For me, it was always about what's, what do I have to get right to heal myself? Um, because I truly believe in the magic of the body and its ability to heal itself if you, if you get it right. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was the other path. It wasn't the work path. It was the personal um, relationships path, and it was the spiritual path, those two things that I'd sort of avoided going into in any depth in the first round. So you start to follow a traditional medical protocol, right? but at the same time you embrace complementary and alternative therapies. Well, I kind of had to, because after that GP visit when he said you've got these two things going on, I went back to see the gastroenterologist, the liver guy, and he said, uh, we can't, the only treatment for your liver at this point is a transplant, but you're not eligible because you have cancer. You have to deal with cancer first. So I went to see the oncologist and he said, I can't help you because the only treatment for a stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma will kill your liver. That was the point at which I went, okay, I guess we have to find another way, mm. maybe in conjunction with or maybe around the medical system because they're not being all that helpful right now. <laughs> and they weren't even talking to each other, right? So If I do this, I die. If I don't do that, I die. If right. I do this, I die. Right. If I don't do that, I die as well. Right. So, yeah, exactly. And you're thinking, what haven't I got right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I'm still think no, I'm, I'm thinking two things. One is, we'll find another way because my... my Mind is like that. I mean, I've never, I love. You'll find another way. <laughs> I love being faced with an insurmountable challenge. It's sort of what drives me in life. I'm for, and obviously this is the ultimate, right? Uh, so yeah. There's, I know maybe there's a screw loose, like, but I was never sort of the poor me. I, I mean, there were moments when I thought, okay, this really sucks. But were you scared? I was scared to death, so to speak. Uh -huh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I also, I mean, until somebody's until somebody's actually shut all the doors, I'm still looking for one to open, right? And so I did that with, I went straight to um, Inspire Health, which is a complementary mm -hmm. care 
facility. Specializing for, in cancer. Yes, yeah. yeah. They were extraordinarily helpful. I mean, the book, there's, it talks about the 11 things that they recommend that uh, have been proven to create conditions for spontaneous remission in cancer patients. Right, and this is work that they're doing with BC Cancer as well. So it's Correct. not like they're like no, uh, they're out of legitimate, the box, woo woo kind of mainstream. stuff. Mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. It's and they work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In yeah. conjunction with the medical system. So the first thing they do is they figure out everything. They read mm -hmm. my binder, and then they talk to your physicians. So they talk to the specialists and sort of get a real reading on what's going on. They actually got the specialists talking to each other. And then they recommend a regime of complementary therapies. So for me, it was, <clears throat> I, I would say, the really most important one of everything they recommended was uh, meditation and visualization. And I'll talk more about that. But they also recommended nutrition, um, a whole different diet approach. There was even a, an experimental clinical trial that they put me on for more for shoring up the immune system so I could tolerate, eventually, chemotherapy, which they figured out with the doctors. I am on the edge of my seat, but unfortunately, we've got to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So they got to keep your liver alive. Yeah. they got to right. try and arrest the cancer. Right or slow it down because they can't give you anything that's going to kill it. No, that's right. And through this process, what are you learning about yourself? I guess I'm learning I'm more resilient than I thought. Uh, I'm actually that's learning. That's a good feeling. It was good. It yeah. was good. Um, I'm learning that I need to slow down mm -hmm. and actually you know, be in the moment with people and really connect. And this is one of the lessons from Inspire Health, but it was also something I just found immensely gratifying was to actually, because you know, you don't know in this situation if you're going to actually be here next year. So I really, I had to take time off work. <laughs> <laughs> you had <laughs> but, no choice. Yeah, yeah but, but I also just took time in every moment with every transaction with my kids, just enjoying everything that presented itself, even sitting in, you know, in the hospital waiting room. <clears throat> trying to connect with other people, and trying to cajole the nurses into having a better day, that kind of thing, just yeah. turned out like it was... Because that's better than being dead. It, it's better than being dead. Yeah. It re reinforces why you're there and why you're alive. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of all about that. So, you were taking on this CAMS or complementary and alternative yeah. approach. So, what starts to happen to your health that now puts you in a position where you become eligible yeah. to... Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> to undergo the treatments right. that can actually uh, get you. So it bought me some time for right. one thing. Um, it got me into a much better mindset because the main thing is, and they, they talk about this at Inspire Health, is when you feel more in control of your situation, it actually turns a switch so that you actually can be in a better position to heal. Yeah. And, and part of that is your positive attitude and its impact on your physicians. So I, I was better able to go back to the oncologist and say, maybe we can find a way. Or I initially mm -hmm. went back to the, the gastroenterologist and said, you know, I'm not going to settle. Let's try and figure this out and see if there's something we can do to shore up the liver to be able to tolerate something, and then they'll figure it out over here. So, uh, you know, I'm getting them talking to each other. So were you in a position where you had to get your liver healthy enough to be yeah. able to take chemo? Yes. You had to take the chemo yeah. so that your cancer was in a uh, good enough position so that you get a liver transplant. Was yeah. that kind of the order? That was the order. The okay. that, as we learned as we went along, that was the sequence of events. So they, the, you know, so I, how did you bolster your liver? Well, through hmm. that was where the complementary therapies really came in. So okay. lots of nutrition, vitamin therapy, um, this this uh, autoimmune booster, a couple of different things that they gave me that were autoimmune boost boosters, and then visualization. Visualization. Yeah. Yeah. So then you get to the point where... I'm healthy enough. You're healthy enough to undergo yeah. a form of chemotherapy. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they, exactly. So they, well, they also, they also put me on steroids. So that was ultimately the medical treatment for mm -hmm. the liver condition. Uh, and that was by no means certain. So everything I was doing, I'm sure, still mm -hmm. contributed to the fact that at the end of the steroid regime, even though it was prednisone that made me loopy, um, I came out of that being less loopy and more fortified. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and only then, the oncologist said to me, okay, I'm willing to try something. It can't be the original 
treatment that they would have given for advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma because it was still too toxic. So what he tried was experimental, right? So he's going, okay, well, let's, let's try this because, you know, it's never worked for anybody, but it might, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and he was... And you're in such dire straits yeah. that we can afford to take the, the, the chance. Yeah, well, yeah. I had to, right? Or you but were going to die. I also mm -hmm. did, and this is something, you know, I talk about in the book, is being an intelligent and forceful patient, not belligerent, but positively assumptive patient, I got three different opinions on yeah, the Yeah, you have to advocate for yourself, right. don't exactly. you? exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is an extraordinary story, but I've got to get you to hang on for just one second while we take our final break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Okay, so now it's time. They get the, the cancer under control. Yes. Now it's time to get a liver transplant. You get the liver transplant. Well, you should. There's a p piece in between because when I said I'm ready yeah. for the list, they said, oh, wait another four and a half years because you have to be in remission for five years before you can be put on the list. But your liver's not going to last that long. No. Okay. Well, I just made sure that it was. I mean, I had no choice, right, again. Yeah. So that's where, again, that, the complementary uh, therapies, all kinds of visualization, doing it, whatever it took to protect what but, was left did of Did you it. have to wait the four and a half I years? I did, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I so you, you eked out every little inch of life that there was in your Pretty liver. Pretty much. I, I think probably the worst phase for me was the end, end stage of the liver before I got put on the list. Because when you're in that stage, people with liver disease, you, you're retaining water. So I was like gaining up to 30 pounds of water every week. I would have to go and get that drained three times a week to be able to even walk because my lungs are compressed. So, I mean, it gets wretched. And then I had hepatic encephalopathy, which is the flushing of ammonia into your brain. Which Were there times where you're starting fatal. to think, I'd rather die than go through this? Yeah, that was when I was thinking. You were, ready, because to, there was you were no, ready to go. There was no guarantee I would ever make it to the list. 30% of the people in those years were dying before they got there. And even on being put on the list, they were still dying before the liver came available. So it, it, was, it was tough times. Yeah. Holy no, smokes. That was when I really had to call into play, you know, all of the mustering of, you know. There's got to be another way. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, then I got to. Get, then I finally got put on the list. Oh my gosh! I, I, how you had the the uh, <laughs> energy, the drive to keep going? I, you know. Yeah, I, and I was still working <laughs> through most of that. You were still working. Yes, I was. But you know, the, I, not to make light of it, I was very, very ill, and that I, you know, finally got put on the list. And that year, yeah, it was a dry spell for organs. Mm -hmm. There was an ambulance strike. It had been by the time I got the call, it had been seven months with no livers available in BC at all. Well, yeah, but then you get the call, you must yeah. be thinking, okay, I made it. <laughs> yeah, I made it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's I made what you it. think. I made it. That's what I thought, yeah. But? <laughs> well, I get in. Uh, <laughs> this is the never-ending story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So I, I have the surgery. It's 19 hours. It's a marathon. You yeah. know, there were several surgeons involved. Again, they had the hemorrhaging issue and, you know, I almost. You could have died there. I, I almost yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, they could have walked away. They could have walked away. Yeah but they didn't. So they, I got out of that, felt like I'd been hit by a truck. But you know, a typical type A patient fashion, I'm up and walking in a couple of days mm -hmm. and the liver's taking beautifully and everything is fantastic. I'm eating well and you know, a couple of weeks go by and I'm ready to go home. And I'm, I literally started packing my bag and then I, I didn't know what was happening, but all of a sudden my hemoglobin went down and they started having to give me transfusions. And I said, is this normal? And they said, no, there's something, but we, don't Something's not right. Something's not right. And then I lapsed into a coma. I actually remember falling on the bathroom floor. And the next thing, well, the next thing I knew, I woke up um, and I had had surgery again. And I'd actually had a second transplant. Of a liver? Of a liver. And they had called my husband aside and said, she has 48 hours. Her liver has died. It's hemorrhaged to the point that we can't salvage it. And if she doesn't get another liver in 48 hours, you need to make other plans. That was like, you know, I still can't think about that without crying. And I was asleep. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't have to hear that. Right. Right. But he did. And my, you know, my family had to really make, yeah. make plans for the worst. Um, so they put a call out through North America, you know, to vicinities yeah. that can actually fly 
from you know get it in there there in time, and lo and behold, they found a liver. Um, I was right told later, right type, right everything. Yeah, yeah, right size and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I was told it was had been slightly traumatized, so it obviously had been an injury of some kind. Um, so it wasn't ideal, but it was it was a liver, right? right. So I, this is, I was told <clears throat> later. So they again another marathon surgery, and it was such a bad candidate for more surgery at that point because obviously you know You've they're keeping me alive yeah. on life support and I yeah. anyway they got through it uh, again I'm you know, probably all the surgeons in the hospital are involved at some point and I wake up not knowing any of it any of it and I'm horrified to be back in ICU intubated and like I'd been hit by a truck and I still had no idea what had happened like none whatsoever and it took me three days to figure it out because I, they all, because they, they all knew what happened, the nurses never say, oh, by the way, you had a second transplant. They just say, oh, so told you're you. doing really yeah. well. And I'm going, mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> like I, I couldn't use my arms and legs. I was that like sick from the surgery. And so I couldn't even write down WTF, you know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> or whatever. So it was, that was brutal. That was brutal. Mm -hmm. It was like being a shut in, you know, like a, a vegetable that you can't communicate and to me that was just the worst of the worst okay you have nine lives clearly <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah but what's the most important thing that you've learned about life from this incredible journey that yeah. you've been on that in a way you yeah. probably wouldn't have known without having gone through it and how can the rest of us learn yeah. from your experience so that we can all live better lives you know it's hard to actually articulate that to people who haven't been through something like this. But to me, it is just that being in the moment. I mean, it's how do you choose to act at this particular moment in time to be fully present to whatever presents itself in a, in a way that you can optimize it. And for me, I was never about that. And I'm still, I still struggle with, you know, getting back on the iPhone or, you know, whatever, zoning out at TV, in TV or something. And then I think, okay, that's not why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Why I'm here is, you know, having a dialogue with Sue. It's, you know, interacting with people mm -hmm. and choosing to go and do that and be social and have relationships and make them meaningful and remember, you know, what it is you appreciate about those people. So being present being present meditation meditation yeah and mm. the visualization thing which is really just you focusing all your energy in a relaxed mode into what you what you want what you need to live in the moment I heard this wonderful thing by Leo Buscaglia who wrote this amazing book called love and mm. yes uh, and just an extraordinary <coughs> speaker and he had this fabulous expression he said yesterday is a canceled check tomorrow is a promissory note. <laughs> Today is cash on hand. Right. Spend it wisely. Yes. Today is a present. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Kathy.